Welcome, everyone. This is the Liberty Classroom course, History of Economic Thought, Part 1. I'm your instructor, Robert Murphy, and we're now on Lecture 4, dealing with Bernoulli, the Physiocrats, and Turgot. Before we start this lecture, let me just make a brief comment referring to remarks I made last time. When we were talking about Mandeville and his famous The Fable of the Bees, I may have led you to believe that I'm the only person who's ever pointed out that Mandeville's arguments are often fallacious, saying things like, oh, well, gee, if everybody became virtuous, that would be bad for the economy because then there'd be no more burglars, and so the industry cranking out locks for doors would, would go out of business, and that would be awful. And and I pointed out, well, well no, that's that's a terrible argument. That's not, you haven't just shown the, the virtues of vice, if you will. All right, so let me just be clear. Rothbard also said the same thing, all right? Um what I, what I meant to, to suggest is that a lot of people in the free market community, if you ask them, what about this fable of the bees, they would probably just echo Hayek and say, oh, yeah, he anticipated Smith, and that was you know great that he showed, uh, even though people were scandalized at the time, he was arguing that actually private vices could be converted through the magic of the market into something that was socially useful. And, and so, yeah, that, that is one way of interpreting what Mandeville did, but the specific way he did it was often quite fallacious. And and so not just me, but Rothbard says the same thing. All right, so I didn't want to mislead you and, and make it sound like I was the only person who's ever noticed that. Okay, turning to today's material, here we see an outline of it for those of you who are following along. Okay, Daniel Bernoulli lived from 1700 to 1782. Some biographical remarks. He was born in the Netherlands to an accomplished family. Daniel Bernoulli became a famous Swiss physician, mathematician, and physicist. Pioneering work done in fluid mechanics, probability theory, and statistics. So you'll see here he's he's a far cry from uh, a philosopher or you know someone who is a literary person. He was very mathematically oriented. So modern economists will generally credit him with being the first one to formally use what they would call expected utility theory, which exhibited diminishing marginal utility. All right, so Bernoulli is not a hero to the modern Austrians by any stretch, but I'm including him in this history of economic thought course because many mainstream economists, you know, if, if they were familiar with his contribution here that I'm going to describe in a minute, would be very impressed and say, oh, wow, some guy back in the 1700s came up with that? That's that's the way we would solve it today. So specifically, there was this thing called the St. Petersburg Paradox. So I'll summarize it. I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit to make it in language that a modern uh, American would understand. So the idea is there's this game, the casino runs, and every time you play, this is the way the game goes for each for each play of the game you start out the casino puts two dollars into the pot and it gives you a coin and you keep flipping the coin and it's a fair coin and so if it comes up heads the game's over or sorry if it comes up tails the game's over and the player gets the two dollars but if the player gets a head then he keeps going and every time a head comes up the casino keeps doubling the amount of money that's in the pot all right, and then so you just keep going with the casino pumping in more and more dollars, doubling every time a head comes up until finally whenever the player flips and gets a tail, then um, the game's over and the player then wins whatever amount of money the casino has put into the pot up to that point. So now the question is, how much should a rational player be willing to pay in order to have the right to play the game one time? All right, so the way the game works is, you pay the casino a flat fee up front, and then you just play the game. All right, so the question is, if this is the way the rules work, and the casino posts some price saying, this is how much we're charging for you to play this game, a rational player should be able to look at that and see whether, huh, is that a good deal or not? Is it worth it for me to pay that flat fee in order to sit down, have the casino put the $2 in the pot, and then give me the coin, and, and I start flipping it, and we'll see what happens and see how much money I walk away with. Okay, so where's the paradox come in? Because if you just sat down and tried to take a, a stab at this, you would get what seems to be a nonsense answer. You might say, 
Well, let's let's figure out what the mathematical expectation is of the payoff in dollars of this game to play at one time. So you would say, okay, let me figure out the probability of every possible outcome, and then I'll multiply that by the number of dollars I get paid in that outcome, you know, so as to weight it by the likelihood of it happening, and then I'll sum that up, and that's what a mathematician means by saying what's the expectation of something. Okay, so if the coin comes up heads, or sorry, tails the first time, the game's over, and the player just wins $2. So what's the chance of that happening? Well, one half. If the player flips a heads on the first toss, the casino doubles it to $4, and now what if the player gets a tails the second toss, game's over, the player wins $4. What's the probability of that happening? Well, it's one half times one half, or one fourth. Okay, what about the player getting two heads in a row and then a tails on the third flip? Well, that's one half times one half times one half, so that's a one eighth probability. And in that scenario, the player walks away with eight dollars. Okay, so if you write it out, or for those who are looking at the PowerPoint, you can see I've got the chart here. It's a pretty straightforward calculation that it's the expected payoff is one half times two plus one fourth times four plus one-eighth times eight, plus da, 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 for infinity. And so each term is one. And so the expected payoff is one plus one plus one plus one da, 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 out for infinity. Or in other words, infinity itself. Okay, so the paradox is that it using this approach, you might conclude, huh, no matter what number the, the casino writes to, on the board saying this is how much we're charging you to play this game one time, if I'm a rational player, I should be willing to pay that, assuming I had that much money to start with. So even if I had $2.7 trillion and the casino says, you get, we're going to charge you $2.7 trillion to play this game one time, I'm going to do it because the expected payoff is infinite. All right, so why is it a paradox? Because that's crazy. That can't possibly be the right answer. Nobody would do that. Most people probably wouldn't pay more than $200 to play this game one time. Okay, so what did Bernoulli say is the solution to this seeming paradox? Okay, so this is Bernoulli writing in 1738. He says, The determination of the value of an item must not be based on the price, but rather on the utility it yields. There is no doubt that a gain of 1,000 ducats is more significant to the pauper than to a rich man though both gain the same amount. All right, so that's an extremely sophisticated statement for someone to be making back in 1738. So to be sure, it does involve what we would now call interpersonal utility comparisons. He's saying that money, you know, a, a, a thousand ducats to a rich man means less to him than the same thousand ducats would mean to a poor man. So he's comparing utilities across individuals and a lot of modern economists, including the Austrians, say that you, that doesn't even make sense. But nonetheless, he certainly, um, if you put that objection aside, Bernoulli has done something pretty astonishing here. All right, he's, he's, he's getting marginal utility analysis. Okay, so what Bernoulli is saying is that instead of viewing a player as maximizing the payoff... Instead, have the player maximize the utility from the dollars in his possession or the ducats. All right, and so if the gain in utility from increments of wealth is diminishing as the wealth increases, then the paradox is dissolved. Okay, so that's very, like I say, a very advanced um, pioneering solution, and that. Uh, in the 20th century, the, the models of utility and the approach of dealing with uncertainty, it's, it's, um, that, that's exactly the way they do it. It's expected utility theory is what it's called. So they say, okay, you have agents. They have these cardinal mathematical utility functions. So we can say for every possible state of the world, how many utils is the agent going to get? But now in the beginning, before we know what's going to happen, the agent has a probability distribution over all those possible outcomes. And then the agent maximizes 
the expectation of that utility function. All right, and so with that approach, I'm not going to get into it right now. We may get into this in, in part two of the course when we get into the 20th century. Um, but with that approach, you can very easily explain things like why do people buy fire insurance? All right, because on the face of it, it seems like a bad bet, if you will, that you know, I'm making these numbers up, obviously, but let's say you got a $100,000 house and there's a 1% chance your house is going to burn down and you want to be fully insured. And so the actuarially fair premium would be $1,000. And yet the fire insurance company might charge you, I don't know, $1,100. And yet most people would pay that. And so, the, gee, that seems like a bad bet. You're paying $1,100 to insure against a loss that only has an expected value of 1000 Why would you do that? Well, because in practice, you're, it's not that you're actually going to lose $1,100. What's going to happen is you're either going to lose zero if there's no fire, or you're going to lose 100000 if your whole house burns down. All right, and so when you get into this issue of realizing that wealth or, or the utility you get from wealth is diminishing as the wealth increases on the margin, well, then you can explain that. That's why you might be willing to pay $1,100 in order to remove that possibility of losing 100000 Okay, and I've already discussed that Bernoulli's discussion assumes interpersonal utility comparisons. Incidentally, though, as we're going to see, even some of the early Austrians do as well. All right, so there's parts in Bumbaver, for example, where... Um, it, it, it looks like it's, it's cardinal utility, at least. Okay. Um, another thing, just as a footnote on this. Yes, Bernoulli's solution did solve the St. Petersburg paradox as it was stated and as it was circulating among the intellectuals of his day. But you could tweak the story, right? So, it, in, in other words, it would specify whatever the utility function is in terms of dollars and then you can have the casino increasing the pile of money accordingly so that even when you take into account the fact that the utility function has diminishing margin utility built into it nonetheless the utility of those ever growing sums you know the two things cancel out so you still get the expected value is you know 1 plus 1 plus 1 or something like that out to infinity okay so the the, the lesson here, it's not so much that Bernoulli has given us something that would work with every possible tweak of that casino game. It's more just saying what he did was realize what was wrong with the original approach and gave a framework that, from our modern perspective, seems extremely advanced. Okay, moving on to the physiocrats. Just to give an overview of this school. So they divided labor into productive and sterile classes and they thought agriculture was productive and then later physiocrats might include all extractive industries right like so you know mining and stuff so if you take coal out of the ground things like that they were the first self-conscious school of economics they were generally laissez-faire um as against Colbertism, so you know they're based in France, as, as the name suggests, the physiocrats. Um, and in that term itself, physiocracy meant government or rule of nature, and that so that that's where they were coming from. So they were laissez-faire against you know the the top-down economic controls of Colbert, and they again their justification for that was not the utilitarian approach that you're going to see like in David Hume. All right, so the, so the physiocrats, I mean, in other words, yes, their policy conclusions were generally laissez-faire. They didn't like top-down planning. They didn't think that you needed the French minister to ensure a favorable balance of trade and make sure that industry was balanced and so on. But beyond that, their, their reasoning was they, that they wanted things to be natural, right? That they, It seemed like a... Um, a violation of, of some deep principle if the government began meddling in things that would be better left to free markets. Whereas, again, thinkers like Hume and Smith, you're going to more get the sense that 
they also it generally are free market laissez-faire, but their reasoning is going to say, well, we think this is what's going to promote the flourishing of society better than these alternate possible policies. The undisputed guru of the physiocrats was Francois Cunet. So he lived from 1694 to 1774. Let me just read because I can't help myself. I can't resist. So Lionel Robbins, when he was lecturing to his class on this topic, he read, so uh, this is in December of 1774 upon the death of uh, Cunet. And so here is um, Marquis Mirabeau talking to the to the crowd you know who came to lament the passing of their leader he says and so they're looking at a bust of cunet while he's saying this gentlemen we have lost our master the veritable benefactor of humanity belongs to this earth only by the memory of his good deeds and the imperishable record of his achievements socrates has been said to have brought down morality from the skies our master has made it germinate upon earth Celestial morality was a guide only for a few chosen souls. The doctrine of the net product, and we'll get to that in a minute, that's a physiocratic doctrine, procures subsistence for the children of men, secures them in its enjoyment from violence and fraud, lays down the principles of its distribution, and assures its reproduction. O oh, bust, so he's talking to the bust of Cunet, O oh, bust, O oh, venerable bust that represents to us the features of our common master, it is before you, it is the vow of universal fraternity which our conscience, enlightened by the teaching of the excellent man whom you portrayed for us, bids us observe. O oh, Master, look down from your heavenly heights, smile still on our words and works and our tears, while my trembling hand offers on your tomb laurels which will never perish. All right, so, I mean, this is, those were some fairly um, complimentary remarks, if you will. So, that was the esteem with which they held Cunet. Uh, Rothbard talks about the fact that, I mean, these guys were definitely a, a school of thought. They had their own thinkers and, and journals and would you know, write glowing essays in support of each other, right? So they're like one big team, and they had fellow travelers, thing, you know, people who were not physiocrats per se, but, oh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm friendly with the physiocrats. I like what they're doing, that kind of stuff. Um, and then, you know, Rothbard, as that last passage I just read to you, Rothbard says, unfortunately, they sort of went past the point of his being a school of thought and arguably, you know, became sort of a cult of personality. Okay, um, so, again, their their main doctrinal point was that, or the way they classified things, their approach to economics was to divide labor into productive and sterile classes and the agriculture was productive. And so since that's the way they thought, they believed that the net product derives solely from agriculture. All right. So it, it's not that they thought the other types of labor were useless, but they were saying that kind of just rearranged or moved around the actual contributions to output that agriculture gave us or the land gave us. Right, and so because they had that view, then they famously advocated just a single tax on land, meaning they wanted to abolish all the other kinds of taxes. All right, so there was a sort of logical consistency there that they thought, if really the only thing that's on net contributing to economic output is agriculture or the land, well, then it would be arbitrary or pointless for us to tax some other part of the economy because that's not really contributing anything on net. Okay, the other thing, and I don't want to spend too much time on these guys, for one thing, I just, I just am not that familiar with them, and I think I should focus elsewhere, but the, the famous contribution and the thing you would come across in any sort of history of economic thought class is Cunet's Tableau Economique. All right, so here I've reproduced uh, a description of it that comes from Meek's book, and Lionel Robbins praises this so that, you know, this is like a very authoritative um, account of what the physiocrats were about. So if you're looking at this, you, you can see how it's laid out. And it, I mean, it, what I want you to take away from this is that they had this, this model of the overall economy. 
And, you know, various people have tried to say this was a predecessor to such and such. And really the closest thing you're probably going to get is Leon TF's input-output tables that would come in the 20th century. Um, you know, th this isn't really even so much of a a general equilibrium framework necessarily. But what is interesting is they do see this the framework, the structure of the economy, and how things are all interrelated. And so that's, you know, again, this was very advanced for its time. And again, my, I read those, uh, the description that one of his disciples gave, and they thought that this thing was, you know, going to, uh, was up there with like the invention of writing. You know, I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating. Like that's how important they thought this was. Okay, moving on to Turgot. He lived from 1727 to 1781. Some biographical remarks about him. So he was born in Paris. His parents were royal officials. So don't misunderstand. I'm not saying his parents were royalty. I'm saying his parents were very high, highly placed in the government uh, hierarchy. Turgot earned honors while studying at the Sorbonne. He became an abbey, but he went into the royal bureaucracy, not the church. And so he declined the sacrament of holy orders in 1750. So in other words, he was studying and was... Um, very learned and was going through all the training that you would if you were going to end up actually becoming a, a priest. But then he didn't, you know, go that full route. He decided at, at some point that, you know what, I'm going to actually go a different direction and go into government service. So his, uh, I think his highest ranking position, we might translate it as the Minister of Finance. Okay, his... his um, most comprehensive work it was very brief, and you can see also from his uh, dates of birth and death, he, he died fairly young, and his longest work was only 53 pages called Reflections on the Formation and Distribution of Wealth, and uh, that came out in 1766. So both Rothbard and Schumpeter were huge fans of Turgot. Let me just read to you. So I've assigned Rothbard's whole essay. If you go to the syllabus, there's a link for that. But let me just um, read to you. So this is Schumpeter talking about Turgot. He's, he's saying that he's referring to Turgot's theory of saving investment and in capital is, quote, the first serious analysis of these matters, and, quote, it proved almost unbelievably hardy. It is doubtful whether Alfred Marshall had advanced beyond it, certain that John Stuart Mill had not. Bumbavrk no doubt added a new branch to it, but substantially he subscribed to Turgot's propositions. And then he goes on saying that Turgot's interest theory is, quote, not only by far the greatest performance the 18th century produced, but it clearly foreshadowed much of the best thought of the last decades of the 19th. And then summing up, this is again Schumpeter looking back, talking about Turgot. It is not too much to say that analytic economics took a century to get where it could have gotten 20 years after the publication of Turgot's treatise had its content been properly understood and absorbed by an alert profession. Okay, so again, this is partly why we study the history of economic thought, because you'll see there's these giants. So earlier we talked about Richard Cantillon and how, you know, his his essay is arguably the foundation of modern economics, um, or, or I should say the f the first systematic treatise in economic theory. And then you see here that Turgot, and we're just going to, in this remaining time in this lecture, just cover some of the highlights, but it is amazing how much he anticipated what would not come out in, in more mainstream circles until more than a century later. Right, so uh, it just shows you that it's not necessarily the case that every every thinker in a certain er era absorbs the best and then just hands it on to the next generation. That a lot of times stuff is lost and then rediscovered later on. Okay, so with having said that, let me just say, in the interest of brevity, I want to keep these lectures in this course manageable. 
I know some of you are driving around or whatever, listening in the car, so I don't want to go on too long, so I just want to give you enough to whet your appetite. I really am going to insist on to go that you read Rothbard's essay on him. All right, so it's in the syllabus. I've given you a hyperlink, or if you just get to a computer, just Google and say Rothbard, the brilliance of Turgot, and it's T-U-R-G-O-T, and you'll get that. It's a, it's a very readable essay, and there's lots of quotes, block quotations from Turgot. If you're looking at the PowerPoint, you can see that i got the drill sergeant pointing his finger at you, saying, read Rothbard on Turgot, right? So you got to do it now, right, because it's the drill sergeant. Okay, but... In the meantime, you're saying, Murphy, give me something I can use here. Give me a taste. Give me a hint. Why do I want to go read this guy? All right, let's talk about his value theory. So he's here talking about two people engaging in a voluntary trade. So this is Turgot. This superiority of the esteem value attributed by the acquirer to the exchange for is the sole motive for it. Each would remain as he was if he did not find an interest, a personal profit in exchange. If, in his own mind, he did not consider what he receives worth more than he gives. Okay, so the, the idea is he's saying, how do we explain this trade? That the acquirer has a superior esteem value given to the thing that he's getting compared to the thing he gave up, All right? And so here in this passage, he is solving the problem that Aristotle bequeathed to us. All right, remember that, and I, I got to be a little careful here because Turgot also talks about how things being exchanged have equal value, and it's, Rothbard gives a, a speculation as to maybe what Turgot meant by that, and I mean, it's, it doesn't make sense. Other, or it's just a completely vacuous sense that when two things exchange, they're both, you know, have equivalent market value because they exchange for each other. Um, but nonetheless, in this passage right here that I just read to you, Churgo nails it. That's how you explain a voluntary trade. And so that blows up the labor theory of value. It blows up Marxism, it, you know, that right there. And it, it shows the, the, the error in thinking if two things trade for each other in the marketplace, there must be something, some magnitude or some substance or some quality that's in both those things and that's equal. And that's why they're trading. No, that doesn't make any sense. You don't need to assume that. In fact, you're going to get stuck if you assume that. If people were just swapping things that they both thought were equal in some respect, according to some criterion, why are they swapping them? Why would you do that? No, what, what actually happens is, when you trade something for something else, you value the thing you're getting more than the thing you gave up. Then you say, oh, well, so then if you got the more valuable thing, that means you must have ripped off the other guy, right? No, because the other guy has the opposite valuation or the reverse valuation. And so that's why I like that Turgot says, if in his own mind, right? So he's emphasizing that this is a subjective evaluation. So again... This is beating a dead horse here, but I really want you to get this point. If two kids are at school trading their sandwiches that their parents gave them for lunch, it can't be that they both walk away with the sandwich that's heavier or the sandwich that has more calories because weight and calorie content are objective features of these objects. But what can happen is that both kids walk away thinking they got the better sandwich or the sandwich that offers more utility because utility is a subjective property that resides in the mind, not in the external physical thing. And so Turgot saw that and understood that that was the way to explain exchanges. So he called it esteem value rather than utility. Okay, he also has some remarks on what we're going to call the water-diamond paradox. We'll probably hit this when we talk about Adam Smith. So Turgot says, Water, in spite of its necessity and the multitude of pleasures which it provides for man, is not regarded as a precious thing in a well-watered country. Okay, so again, Turgot is seeing the uh, importance of scarcity or supply. That water, yes, it's necessary for life, and it 
provides all sorts of services, but we don't consider it to be precious. It doesn't have a high market value so long as we're in a normal region that has a lot of water. Okay, and the last uh, general topic I want to talk about is Turgot's defense of usury. Not so much because, um, you know, this is such a huge point, but just it it just emphasizes or epitomizes what a great thinker he was and how advanced he was and how, I mean, if he were alive today, I'd get the guy a blogger account and say, go at it. Because uh, just even you know, his rhetorical style, the the arguments he made in his economic analysis and his grounding in principles of rights and so on, I mean, you're just, it's it's amazing. Okay, so one thing he says, so again, just let's not get confused. Remember, we still are operating with this heritage passed down from the Greeks, continued from the scholastic thinkers, the Catholic Church, saying that usury is either just flat out a sin and you shouldn't do it, or you know, there's all sorts of um, regulations concerning the appropriate way you can go about it and exemptions and things like that, but clearly... This is an area that um, is is heavily regulated, if not outright prohibited. And so, Turgot was going to argue and and say, well, you know, why why do we have this attitude? What what's what's the big deal with someone charging interest on a loan? So he says, first and foremost, look, a lender has the right to require an interest for his loan simply because the money is his property. All right, so he's just kind of making a property rights argument, saying, look, at this is a voluntary transaction. If, if, if I own this sum of money, why don't I have the right to say if someone wants to borrow it from me, you have to pay me back the principal plus 10% interest? Why can't I say that as a condition of borrowing my property? Oops. Okay. My uh, PowerPoint was uh, animation was out of order, but now I got them both up there. He also argues that loans are voluntary. So somebody who attacks lenders saying that, oh, the person lending the money is taking advantage of the borrower who is, is desperately in need of a, of a loan, and so that's unfair, and you know that, that's an unseemly thing to do. Well, Turgot says, well, wait a minute. That kind of argument, that would be like, and I'm quoting, saying that a baker who demands money for the bread he sells takes advantage of the buyer's need for bread. Right, so again, a very clever argument. And he's saying, why are why are we focusing on capitalists who have money to lend, and we're getting mad that they're earning a profit, if you will, from that activity? They're charging people money to borrow money and repay it. You can, that's one way you can think about what interest is. And so, why you know you could if they're if you're going to say, oh, they're taking advantage of people's need. Well, again, couldn't you just say the same thing about? Anybody who's selling anything to, to customers, that the only reason the customers are buying that stuff is because they want it, or in the case of food and shelter and clothing, it's because they, you quote, need that stuff. And so if we're going to condemn the capitalists for charging interest, do we condemn the home builders for you know making a profit, charging above their costs, and so forth? Okay, now... The But the most sophisticated thing he does here, and this is why, uh, again, going back to what Schumpeter was saying, that Turgot's analysis here is, is breathtaking. All right? and I'm, I'm not just saying that lightly. It really, I really want to encourage you once again to, to read Rothbard's essay to see some of the passages. Because once we, we get to Bumbavark, we're going to cover it and we're going to see that Bumbavark in the 1880s is going to be razor sharp and go through the writings on interest from previous thinkers. And we're going to say, oh, thank goodness, finally now interest theory is in the hands of a mind as sharp as Bumbavark because you really need to be careful about the timing of things. That's really, you can't understand interest unless you t- consider fully the time element. All right. And as we'll see, though, Turgot nails it much earlier than Bumbavark at least this one element of it. Okay, so remember, part of what Aristotle and the scholastics had said about why is usury 
unnatural, you know, just something seemed creepy about it. One way of ex- expressing that concern or that disgust even would be to say, um, look, money is barren. It doesn't produce anything. And so it's just, it's odd. Like if, if you lend someone a hundred units of money, then sure, they owe you, the, they have to return it to you. But then why would they char- Why would they give you more on top of that? That doesn't make any sense, right? And so it seems like they're giving you more than what they took from you. And so that's, that seems to be what's, what's the problem here. That's one of the um, principles that made the people who were against usury think there was something unnatural about it. So in response to that sort of argument, Turgot asks his reader to consider, quote, the difference in usefulness which exists at the date of borrowing between a sum currently owned and an equal sum which is to be received at a distant date. All right, so let me just say that, paraphrase it. He's saying, look, at, at the moment, so you're, the problem is you're looking at it and saying, oh, today I'm lending someone $1,000 now we wait for 12 months to pass. Now the guy's going to come and repay it. And why doesn't he just give me the $1,000 back? Because $1,000 is $1,000. Why instead are you asking for 1100 Murphy? What are you doing that for? You're asking for more than you gave him. But Turgot was saying, no, no, no. There you're letting a year pass. You're comparing, you're comparing apples and oranges. The right thing to do is to say, at the moment when I give the loan to the person, even if I, if I know the person's good for it, so we're not even taking into account the risk of default. But at that point, if I give the person a thousand dollars, what is he giving me? He's giving me an IOU that says in 12 months, I will pay you. And then the question is what? And so Trigo is saying, if at that point, the person gave you an IOU that says in 12 months, I will pay you Murphy 11 or sorry, a thousand dollars. Well, then that wouldn't be giving me the same thing back. Because you'd rather have $1,000 now in your hand than just a promise to get $1,000 a year from now. And Sir Dugo is saying that if I give a loan of $1,000 and get an IOU, <coughs> excuse me, for 1100 well, then that arguably restore some, you know, not a quality, but makes the things comparable. Okay, so taking the time element into account is the way to solve this, and it's extremely advanced. Like I say, we won't get this until we get to Bumbavrk, which is not going to happen until the 1880s.